There was a time when the only people painting things on rocks were college freshmen who were doing it as some kind of fraternity initiation assignment. The disease spread rapidly, though, and today in many major cities, the graffiti sprayed on almost every flat surface dominates what meets the eye. Most of us are satisfied with relatively modest ways of trying to make posterity aware of our having lived here on Earth. The kids seem to have given up on some of the traditional ways and are seeking instant immortality the easy way, with a spray paint can. Who does all this stuff? She the, does. The, <laughs> you know, the people, they, they, they write their name around so they could be known. It don't make no kind of sense. They want to be known, they don't have to spray their name around, right. you know? What do the numbers mean? 61, 89, 135, 62, what, 83. What do they mean? They mean the streets that they live on. <laughs> That's their street address? Yeah. So they really, you think they're trying to be famous? Yeah. Yeah. You do it? No, I don't do it a lot. What do you use? You use spray paint cans? Who, oh, me? Well, anyone who does. <laughs> yeah, they use spray paint cans. Or magic markers. Magic markers? Or yes. shoe polish. Or what? Or shoe polish. Now, you seem to know. Are you an expert? Yeah. Uh, you know kids who do it? Yeah. Not you, though. I know a lot. Why do you think they do it? Trying to be famous. To be famous? Do you think it works? Yes, I think it works. Yes. Think it works? Yes. Me, right? <laughs> you think there's any way to stop it? Yes, yeah, stop selling spray paint. Stop selling spray paint. Yeah, but people need that, don't they? Yes, whoever, whoever buys spray paint, they should write their names down. Whoever buys spray paint, write their names down like they're buying a gun? No. Yeah. How many of the kids do you suppose do it around this neighborhood? One out of three, one out of two, what? We have three. One out of three. One out of three? How many? Practically the whole project. So people over there, man, everybody writes their name around. Yeah. 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 I think if they stop, if they stop showing their names in the newspapers, maybe they would stop doing it. I mean, maybe we even shouldn't be here. No, like y'all throw when they want, when they spray their name, they want it to be shown on the newspaper. So y'all show it and they get what they want. But if y'all stop, if y'all won't show it on the papers no more, they won't do it because they know it ain't gonna get around. Might be an idea. There's a school of libertarians which contends that graffiti is a popular art form, comparable to the work of prehistoric man in Neolithic caves. Most graffiti, though, is drawn not by young artists bursting to express themselves. It's done as an expression of contempt or defiance, an attempt to disrupt the orderly course of a social system they either don't understand or don't feel they are a part of. If it is art, as its defenders contend, it is art out of place, which is not art at all. Michelangelo didn't paint on the floor of the Sistine Chapel. Tall buildings ring the public parks in big cities, reminding everyone that the park is an artificial wilderness, nature reconstructed to look like nature. If graffiti is offensive smeared on the sides of buildings, there is something even worse about it in a natural setting. The best thing about nature is not green grass and growing things, but the absence of people. A park in the city attracts large numbers of people. As soon as they come, they make it look like what they came there to get away from. Public service signs erected for the purpose of warning, guiding, or directing have from time to time been a minor source of irritation to most of us. No one likes to be told to keep off grass he had not intended to walk on. The vandals, though, find these signs an irresistible target. The residue of pleasure in America is garbage. We seem always to make a mess having fun. Our grossest national product is empty beer cans. We mine aluminum here, drill for oil there, and grow corn someplace else. After turning it all into some kind of garbage, we drop it where we used it. We ruin both the ground we took it from and the ground we drop it on. Eventually, we will have taken the earth apart, piece by piece, and put its components back in disarray. Anyone looking for aluminum would have to sift the whole world to find it all. A walk through many big city parks is enough to make you conclude that the society of man is declining. 
He builds himself tables in public places for a game of the intellect. They are destroyed by what appear to be the superior forces of the enemies of intellect. Anyone looking for a quiet place to sit in many parks is apt to find that the wooden slats of the benches have been broken for fun in summer or burned for warmth in winter. Designing park equipment has become a contest between engineer and vandal. The engineer tries to design the indestructible bench. The vandal tries to find a way to destroy it. So far, the vandals are leading. Cemeteries are favorite targets. This 150-year-old graveyard was laid waste in eight hours one night last August. 400 large and small monuments had been tipped over or broken. The replacement cost would run into the hundreds of thousands, although many of them will never be replaced, of course. Cyrus Fowler, beloved husband of Mary Fowler, born 1827, died 1871. Who would pay to have Cyrus Fowler's memorial repaired? Not Mary Fowler. 38 states have passed laws making parents responsible for the vandalous acts of their children. Some judges have sentenced young people to clean up some mess they've made. Vandals aren't caught very often, though, and nothing seems to deter them. It would appear as if the answer is not higher fences around cemeteries, windowless schools, and tougher laws. The answer is in making the vandals understand that it's their cemetery, their school, their country they're tipping over. Last year in the United States, schools estimated their loss from vandalism at $151,431,000. $43,000,000 of that went to repair broken windows. Washington, D.C. spends more than a quarter of a million dollars on school windows. New York spends a million. The game is to see how many school floors high you can wing a rock heavy enough to break a pane. Older schools are being equipped with expensive protective equipment designed to screen out rocks. The vandals are not always deterred. Or maybe they're throwing the rocks from the inside out now. New schools in many cities are being designed without exterior windows at all. They present a solid facade of brick and nothing for a daydreaming student to stare out at. Last year, $20 million worth of classrooms were deliberately set on fire. In Los Angeles, school insurance rates are up 50% in five years because of the frequent incidents of arson. There probably aren't many among us who at one time or another have not pounded on the coin box of a public telephone in anger trying to get our dime back. The telephone company has made its equipment relatively impervious to this kind of treatment. Knowing their clientele, they expect it. The destruction of telephone coin boxes is something different though, and it is a very popular way the vandals have of expressing their discontent, not so much with the phone company, but with society in general. Bell Telephone, which owns 90% of all the instruments in the country, spent $12 million repairing the work of the vandals in 1971. Guess whose telephone bill that goes on? 